Would you join me for a word of prayer and we'll get started this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for how you minister to us and work through us. And Father, we pray that we will be receptive to the Holy Spirit's leading today and allow you to do whatever you want to do in each and every one of our hearts and lives. Thank you for loving us and drawing us to yourself. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chelsea? Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, why don't we stand? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and just say that you're glad that they're in church today?
everyone here this morning and I hope the service is a blessing to you. Um, if we have any first time visitors out there, we have a connection card in the back of the pew. If you could fill that out for us and put it in an offering plate or hand it to uh, the pastor as you're going out the door, uh, we'd love to have a record of your visit. Uh, on, on the other side, we have a place for prayer requests. So if there's anything that uh, you need prayer, prayed for, it, um, that will happen through this week and even today as the service is going on. So if you would bow with me for the offering in the service. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day that you give us. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and to worship you, Lord. I just pray that you be, use these offerings as, a, uh, as you see fit to use them, Lord. I just pray that you be with Mike as he leads this service today. Just pray that anyone here today that doesn't know you would step out on faith, Lord. 
We thank you for all the many blessings in our lives, and we just thank you for your, for your forgiveness and your salvation. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, folks. Hope everybody's doing okay today. Got plenty of rest. At least you got your hour. Did everybody catch up on their hour they lost last week? Hope so. Well, no, not everybody. Okay, good. Most of us have. Some of us haven't. That's all right. If you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. <coughs> That's where we'll be this morning, Hebrews 10, 1 through 18. Kind of walking through that a little bit today. Uh, and if you have your copy, and if you're able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word this morning? Hebrews 10, 1 through 18. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, For the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never be the same, can never, by the same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, <coughs> when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this we will, by this, this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily, ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from, from them that time onward until his enemies he made a footstool for his feet. Nor by one offering, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no, no more. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer an offering for sin. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for how you speak to us today. And I pray, Father, use me to faithfully communicate your word as your vessel for your purposes and your plans for this body of believers. And Lord, we just pray you use this time as you desire. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still fight, I, fighting. I finally caught what the rest of the household had, whatever it was. So I got a little bit of that going on today. Hopefully I'll be through with this soon. I'm tired of it. Uh, but anyway, uh, kind of walking through this. As this text is one of those, it's, you know, there are texts in the Bible that literally preach themselves. They do is read it and it preaches itself. This is one of those texts. Because really what the author is laying out for us here is the reality, not only of who Jesus is, but what he has accomplished for us in his one-time sacrifice for our sins, 
that we will be celebrating here in just a few weeks. It's hard to believe. You realize Easter is just around the corner. You do realize that. Palm Sunday is coming. I mean, all those days are coming. Everything is it's going to be pressing in on us before we know it. That season of the year is here. But this is really a reminder, I think, to us that the, the author of Hebrews gives us of what Jesus accomplished by his sacrifice, how he changed us, how he molded us, how he delivered us from our own sin, our own destruction, our own self-centeredness. He did all that by that one-time sacrifice. Because in the days, as he describes here before that, they had a system. They had a system known as the sacrificial system where you went to the temple and you, if you didn't have animals, which most people didn't, you paid for animals and they sacrificed those animals for your sins. And there was, it was quite an interesting place there at the temple in Jerusalem when people would come and partake of that. And it was a way that was established. If you go back in the Bible, look in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, those kind of things. If you've been reading along with us through God's word, we're kind of getting to that point in Deuteronomy and kind of moving towards the end of the first five books where it really talks a lot about what the sacrificial system that was established was about and why that was done. And, and it's, not, it's not so much done just to make us feel better about ourselves, but it's done to help us understand the cost of our sin. As we talked about, I believe, a week or two ago, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Our sin is serious business in the eyes of God. When I sin, and you may, and you know, may, I'm not saying any of us in this room have done anything horrific, you know, that would probably put us on the newspaper, but we all have sin in our lives, right? We all do things we know we're not supposed to. We disobey God. We disobey the precepts and teachings of God, and we do our own thing, and we rebel against God in a variety of ways, and that is sin. And when we but when we do sin, there are consequences for sin, much like there are in our own world when people break the law in our culture today, there are consequences, right? And we, we appreciate that. We want there to be consequences for breaking the law. Otherwise, you think it's crazy now driving on 270? Imagine what it would be like if it was like the Autobahn in Germany where they don't have a speed limit. Can you imagine 270 with no speed limit? That would be frightening. Sometimes people drive like they don't have one anyway. I get that. Okay, I understand. But imagine if they didn't even have even the opportunity to be ticketed or pulled over or anything, and the police just kind of said, well, as long as we don't have a wreck, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to let it go. You know, that would be a scary place. It would remind me of like one of those racetracks down the south, you know, where NASCAR, where they go wild and crazy, you know, and they drive really fast. And that was what it would probably be like. And what would our culture be like if we did not have those restrictions and those rules and those guidelines and those laws that help us focus on living in a way that help us just be civil to one another? And really the purpose of the law is to, to do that, not just the, the laws of the United States, but the laws in Scripture is to help us understand how to relate to one another, how to accomplish it. The law was never meant to save us in the Scriptures. You're not saved by what you do, by obeying the law, by being a good person or trying to do all the right. That does not deliver us from our sin. It does not make up for the sin that we have already committed. Now, I don't know if this ever happened in your household, but I mean, I, I grew up in a household with, my parents had the three of us, myself and two younger sisters. And there were times that one of us children didn't do what we were supposed to do. Can you imagine that? I'm sure that doesn't happen in your house, but it did in our house quite frequently. And usually I was the one. But anyway, my sisters were all, but they're pretty good at it too. We, we all, that was one skill that I guess we all had pretty well was not doing what we're supposed to do. But I can remember one time I did something and it was dumb and I got in trouble. And then so I tried to make up for what I did wrong by trying to fix some things around the house and trying to, you know, I thought I would placate my mother's wrath by that. I thought that would impress her. Didn't work, by the way, but I tried it. I thought, you know, I'll just, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll clean some things up. I'll, 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 you know, fix my room up. I'll do some things and she'll be impressed by that, that she won't care that what I did wrong, it won't matter anymore because I've, I've done some good deeds in a sense to appease her anger and to, uh, to take care of the problem. But that doesn't work in life. And why do we think that works in the eternal economy of God? That if we just do some good things that will placate God's wrath, that will deliver us from our sin, that will make up for the bad that we can do. When someone hurts you, it's hard to remember the good things and the nice things that they do for you, isn't it? Because that pain and that hurt is there. And when we're talking about sin here, it's much even more serious than what I've even discussed in my little trivial illustrations of it. It's a, something that creates a separation, a wall of separation between us and God. No longer do we have that communion because of the sin that was committed, which is why there has to be a sacrifice for our sins. There has to be a way to make that right. 
And God understands it. And that's what he lay, has been laying out throughout the book of Hebrews. We've been looking at the sacrificial system and what it looks like. And then he, after all of these things he's talked about as a reminder, he begins to talk, tell us about the one that came to the world. Notice in verse five, there's a shift, you know, about all these things he's talked about. And he says, therefore, when he comes in the world, he's talking about Jesus. And he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. All, and imagine what it was like at the temple when they were sacrificing. And there were hundreds of animals being butchered and slaughtered and sacrificed for God because you have all these people that are coming to offer their sacrifices for their sins. All of that does not appease God's wrath. Yet, let me get there. That, that's what, but we think it is. We think that all our, our religious ritual, all the things that we do, will impress God so much that he will forget the sin that we have committed or that lies in our hearts. We think we can somehow distract him maybe from our sin with all our goodness and all our ritual. And this is the emptiness of the ritual and the religion that we sometimes can become a part of. And even as Baptists, we like to say as Baptists, we don't believe in the ritual, which is really funny, because what do we do every week? We sit in the same spot. Right? Right? And we like to sing the same songs and the same, be even more important, the same number of songs before the pastor speaks, right? And we have an order the way we do things here at our church. And I'm not, I'm not, this is not condemning anyone. This is just reality. We do because we're creatures of habit. We have certain things that we do and we kind of have it set and then we go and we've done our thing. And that's our religious ritual that we have because as, as human beings, we like that. But even as good as that is, that does not save us. Going to church will not save you, right? It will not. And I used to love what the late Keith Green used to say. He, he, he heard it for, I heard it from him first. I don't know if he was the first one who said it. But he said, going to church does not make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger, right? I love that. <laughs> because it just doesn't work. And yet we think it does. We think, well, I've done this, so God's happy with me now. And it's not, that, it's not that God's up there mad and ready to zap you. It's how do you make yourself right with God? How do you have that kind of relationship? And this is what he's talking about. There's only one way, and that one way is a person, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus has done everything to make it right. And that's what I think the author of Hebrews is really going to focus on towards the end of this text as he begins to help his readers understand that it's all these things that we thought we knew, because he's talking to Jewish believers here in this text. That's why it's called the letter to the Hebrews. Duh, right? He's trying to help them understand that. That it, all those things that you thought, and there was a struggle that was going on in the early church. I've mentioned it before, and it's, it's pretty evident. There was a struggle that some people believed that if you wanted to be a true follower of Christ, well, you had to become a Jew first and then become a follower. You had to observe the law, do all the things of the law, all the rituals, and then come to Christ, and then, Jesus, then God would have you. And Paul, he did not write Hebrews, I don't believe. Some, some, some would testify that. There's no real record or evidence that he did that. But I believe the writer of Hebrews was conveying the same truth that that is not what our salvation is about. It's not about the rituals. It's not about the, the things that we think are so essential. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what changes us, that willingness. And he goes on here to, to, to describe the work of Christ for us so clearly. Go on down and he says here, and uh, I'm going to just kind of read in verse 8 and kind of, but it's going to get down a little farther. He says, after saying this, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings, sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ all the time, right? Several times, right? No. Once for all. How many times did Jesus die on the cross? Once. That's all it took to bring about our salvation. You see, in the system before, every time you sinned, you had to commit a, a sacrifice for whatever sins that were, those were. You know, there was variety. And you can go through the book of Leviticus especially, and it will lay out all the different and your eyes will start rolling the back of your head, at least mine do when I read it. And all the different sacrifices and for each and every sin, because we got a lot of them, right? A lot of different kinds of sin. But what he is saying that Jesus' sacrifice for us is able to cover all sin for all time once. 
Only Christ can do this. Only Jesus can do this. No one else could accomplish this. Only the Son of God can do it, and he did. And for that, I don't know about you, I am beyond grateful. Grateful is not even an appropriate word. It's not even enough to establish the feelings that I have to think about that one time, that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, when he died on the cross for us, that completely opened the door for that relationship with God that you and I can have. It's a powerful thing, and the author of Hebrews understands that and says, and I love that once for all. That's my favorite three words in that verse, that it's, it's one time. He doesn't, we don't, and every time, we don't have to keep putting him back on that cross because he's not going back on that cross anymore. He doesn't have to. He's already done it. And now we serve a resurrected Savior, amen? We serve a Savior who is alive today at work amongst, the one that transforms us, one that changes us, one that is able to turn us from the men and women that we were to the men and women of God that he wants us to become as we surrender to him. He's able to do that. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells us that we're able to live lives that we could never live in our own power. And that's a message in of itself that we don't have time really to get into today. But let me kind of move on down here in this text because there, there's so much here. And like I said, I, I always say this, and I, I do mean it. I feel like I am skimming this. I encourage you to go back and read over this. Feel free to look at some commentaries and spend some time because there is so much here that the author lays out for us about what Jesus accomplishes for us. And he goes back and refers in verse 11 to the way the priests would do that, and they would have these sacrifices, all these things. But I love verse 12, and that, that big, important three-letter word, but. All these things are true, but he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he says it again, just so you understand it, didn't miss it the first time. He did all this, and then he did what? He sat down at the right hand of God, I'm done. And what are the last words of Jesus on the cross recorded? Or the last, it's, it's one word, but the word is, it is finished. It's tetelestai, and I don't know, miss, I'm, I, know I, I don't know I remember make very well, and I'm butchering it, that's okay. But that word means it's finished, it's come, and it doesn't mean just it's over, it means it's completed. It's all done, everything's wrapped up, I've done everything that needs to be done. So there is nothing else that needs to be added to accomplish the salvation of God apart from the work of Jesus Christ. And any time we try to add anything, and it may be a good thing, anything, and say it's Jesus plus this, we have slipped into heresy. Better yet, we have become, it is anathema. Because we have said that the finished work of Christ is not enough. That I need more than Jesus. Brothers and sisters, you don't need more than Jesus. Jesus is more than enough. He is all you need for salvation. He alone if God could have accomplished it any other way than sending his one and only son to die on a cross and die a horrifically brutal, bloody, gory death for our salvation, to shed his blood, all those things that he experienced that is really hard at times to wrap my mind around and probably for you as well, that, he, that if God could have found another way than that, don't you think he'd have done it? But the father knew that was the only way. <coughs> to bring about our salvation and our deliverance and bring us to becoming a part of God's family forever. And out of his great love for us, he allowed that to happen. And out of Jesus' great love for the Father, he was willing to do whatever was necessary. And, and I don't know any other way to say it, but I am, you know, when I get, when I get to heaven, God's not going to say, well, were you a pastor? He doesn't care if I was a pastor. That means nothing. Did you go to church? Well, yeah, but that doesn't, he's not going to ask that question. It's going to be all about my relationship with Jesus. And the same is true for you, isn't it? I go there and will be in God's family and God's presence forever because of what Jesus Christ did for me on Calvary. That's all I got. It's not because of me. It's not because of anything I do. It's all because of what God has done for me in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? I mean, that's what it's all about. It's because of him. I'm so grateful for that. So grateful that my salvation does not depend upon me because I'd find a way to mess it up. How about you? I'm good at messing things up. I'm really good at it. That's, that's a skill. I guess if that were on my skill sheet, you know, you're doing resumes, I could probably put messing things up. I don't think I'd get hired for that. But anyway, I think I, that, that's one that could go on there, right? Because I'm good at that. I've had a lot of practice, and I still do well with it. 
doesn't impress anybody, but it's just a skill I have, I guess. And we all have that skill, unfortunately. That's why I, 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 it pains me to hear some of my brothers out in pulpits talking about, you know, it's Jesus plus. And they do. And some of these people are well-respected ministers of the gospel. And I'm like, buddy, you and I need to get together in a room. We need to look at the Bible again. I think you're missing something really important here. Salvation is not based in the works of man. And by that, I mean humanity. We, there's nothing that we do that saves us. It's all a work of God. Hallelujah. I mean, that excites me. Because if it, like I said, if it's something I can do, then it also means it's something I can undo. Anyway, we'll get into that. So that's a whole other, we won't go there. That's a whole lot to talk about there. But let me kind of walk through. We're near, I'm, I know we're going to try to get near the end here. I know that makes you nervous if I keep, some people like to watch and know where I'm in the text and they figure this is how much longer I got to put up with this guy. So anyway, as he describes that, I, I, in verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Understand your salvation is not just, you don't have to go to hell. That's not what salvation, it's bigger than that. To some people, that's all it's about. And that, that's a great thing, you know, that's a wonderful thing. None of us want to go there. But it's about being sanctified, being transformed, being so that we can be useful for the purposes of God, both in this world and eternity. He's going to change us. He's, he's changing everything about us. He's changing our character. He's changing our will and our want to. He's changed our heart. That's something only God can do. I don't know how it is for you, but I've seen it in my own life and I've seen it in the lives of others where, you know, we try hard to do the right thing and yet sometimes we try so hard and then even we have the, the best intentions and then we just don't quite live up to our expectations. That's, part about being, that's a part of being human. We, and I'm going to say this and it's going to sound mean, but it's true. We never do that. We always fail when it comes to those kind of things. And I'm not saying that we do something horrific and bad and, and something awful, but it's, you know, it, it can be something almost as trite as you want to show kindness to someone who is unwilling to show kindness to you. That's hard, isn't it? If someone's in your face and being very belligerent and frustrated, and yet we're told in the scriptures, right, but to turn the other cheek, to show kind, right? That's, am, I, am I making this up? I hope not. That's a principle that's there, that even when people, it's not, you just don't kind just to those who are kind to you, you seek to show compassion and mercy, that fruit of the spirit of kindness, even to those who are unkind and unhospitable to you, you still show it and seek to be that way. That's, that's hard. And it's easy to slip into the trap of saying, well, you know, I, no, they don't deserve it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm, I'm just going to move on. But the sacrifice of our Savior, what he has done, that's that part of sanctification is he's able, he enables you to live in a way that you cannot live in your own strength. Things that you would try, if you tried in your will to do, if you try to do the right thing, have the right motives to do that, you would event, it'll eventually fail. We will, we will fail. That's what we do. But because of the Holy Spirit within us, because we've been sanctified and changed, we are able to live a life that is beyond what is humanly possible because it's not about us living it, it's about the Holy Spirit working in and through us and by the power, of grace, the power and grace of God, the work of Jesus Christ in us, we become changed people, right? He changes us. That's the beauty of the gospel. When you encounter Jesus, you're not the same person anymore. Now, it doesn't mean all the bad stuff goes away and you suddenly are a brand new person and never make any, that's not what it means. That sanctification is a process. Is God working in you? And we sometimes see that in our lives, in the lives of others as well. When we were, you know, behaving a certain way that was, was not helpful to our walk or anyone else's, but God over time changes us, molds us, so that we become the men and women of God that he wants us to be. Maybe one of the, I think one of the big areas where you see that is in prayer life. I'm going to ask a dumb question. How many of you think you pray enough? That's kind of what I expected. We're all there. Prayer life, our prayer life, our, our intimate walk with God, that time of prayer is something that all of us believe and know that we wish we could do better or more or more effectively, right? We know that. It's a part of who we are. And it's one of the chief areas where the enemy likes to distract us. If he can keep you off your knees, 
For him, the battle is half won. Because when you're on your knees, when you're in, in prayer, when you're before the Father, it, it's, it changes us when we're in God's presence, doesn't it? He transforms us when we're in, in, that, in that communion with him and we're spending time with him and we're going before him on a, on a regular basis, not just at mealtime and before bed. I mean, when you're spending time with him and, and, hearing, and, and, and praying and hearing the voice of God speaking to you, teaching you as the Holy Spirit ministers to you, it changes us. And Satan does not want you to do that. He really doesn't care if you go to church. He really doesn't care if you get on YouTube and listen to all these great preachers out there. And there's some good ones out there. Or even if you come in here and listen to me, that, that's, not, that's not his, he, that, he, that, he's okay with that. But you start praying, oh, he hates that. He hates prayer more than any other aspect of our spiritual walk. And he wants to stop us from that. Why do you think it's so hard? Harder for us to really get focused. And, you know, there's so many things that distract us. That's a, a thing that we struggle with. But anyway, let me kind of get off that. I'm sorry, I got on, a, got on a tangent. That's what we preachers do, right? We get on tangents. But understand as we walk through, let me finish this text up here as we walk through these things. This covenant that he makes with us, as he describes it in verse 16, this covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I love this, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. Think about that. He puts his laws upon our heart. Now, why would he do that? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? You know that verse. And the heart is not necessarily the organ he's talking about here. That's not what he's talking about. It's the heart is the idea in the Hebraic mind is the heart is the center of who you are. It is your will. It's where everything It's about who you are. It's what affects your behavior, affects your conduct, affects your mind, your thoughts, your will. He allows you, as, as he puts that on you, then the word of God tempers that and enables you to live in such a way that you exalt and honor your Savior, that you live in a way that glorifies him, that you live in a way that sees you have the heart and mind of God in the way that you conduct your life. Not by your own strength, but because of what he does. And that's what he says. And then in verse 17, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. How does that sound to you? All the, the junk that we've done, all the wrong that we've done, all the wrong that we've thought or planned is no more. It's gone. What does God do with your sin when you confess it? Keeps it in a little storehouse, right, to bring up later, right? No. Scripture, one, another text says he takes his, removes it as far as the east is from the west. Now, that's, he's not being literal. He's being very, I think, very powerful to understand how far is ultimate east from ultimate west. Now, this is a globe. It's, they come back together, right? But it, they're thinking on a linear plane there. It's a long way. He takes your sin and he removes it. It's gone. It's forgotten. It's no more. And as I believe the writer of Hebrews wants these believers to understand, that's what God has done. He has removed that from you. So there's no longer a need to go through the systems, the structures, the things that you used to do to bring about that forgiveness because God has changed you. God has altered you. And he desires to do so much more. So what about us today? Saying, well, that's that's nice, preacher. You got all these things in there. We've talked about. You've talked about, and I guess that's wonderful. But what does it mean about mean to us? It really is pretty basic when you think about it. It's about allowing God to do in you what only He can do. It's really understanding that that principle that when you become a follower of Christ, as Paul says it so well in 2 Corinthians five, you are a new creation. You're not a refurbished creation. You're a new creation. Now, what's the difference? Well, that's pretty easy. When I was growing up, my mom, you know, I was one of those kids that grew like a weed. You never had one of those? And so going through clothes, was, especially in my early, those adolescent years, it's like she had to buy me a new pair. Of, I, my jeans, my legs, just they were growing. So my mom was trying to figure out ways to make the jeans last longer than a couple months because I was just growing through them. And then look kind of, you know, when, you, when you're growing, when you were one height and then you grow two or three inches, your jeans look a little different on you, right? They, they called them in my day. I don't know what they call them now. They call them high water, you know. 
don't know what they call them now. Maybe they still use that term. And I'd have those. And that was the reason why. It wasn't because my parents were cheap. because I was growing too fast for a stage. There was a stage there where I was really, of course, it stopped, you know, unfortunately. But that's what happens. But, and, and it was the changes. And so what do you do? So my mom would find ways to kind of alter them and, and fix them and kind of, like, for lack of a better term, refurbish my jeans. Does that make sense? So they would look a little better and last a little longer. And, of course, it was another issue that had, now many of you may be not old enough to remember this, but the thing called knee patches. You remember those, knee patch? You know? Now, why did we have those? Because what's the first thing that wears out on a pair of jeans? The knees. Why? Because we're on them all the time. We're out crawling around in the dirt, doing whatever. That's what we did. I don't know what y'all did. Maybe, you know, more civilized than we were. We were out crawling around doing stuff. And, and that's, so my knees would wear out. And so mom would get those little patches. And of course, you'd get cool ones when you were, if you were lucky. My mom, for some reason, because I had sisters, she thought flowers would look good on my jeans. I tried to tell her no, but she did anyway. So, you know, I looked really stupid. But anyway, no wonder nobody wanted to have anything to do with me when I was a kid. But that's what, that's, the, that's what we think God does with us, that God just kind of patches us up and kind of dusts us off and says, okay, you're good for now. No, he completely remakes you. That's what, that, that's what Paul's talking about here. You are a brand new creation, starting completely over. He has completely, radically transformed you from within. He has changed your will. He has changed your spirit. He has completely transformed it by his power, by the work of God. That's what he's talking about here. And that's what this, this walk with him is about. It's not about fixing us up. It's about making us new by the power and work of Jesus Christ, by, by what God has done. And so as you walk this life with him, realize that what Jesus is able to do in you is something no one else can do in you, and it's more than anything you ever dreamed of. And he loves you, and he desires to change you. And one of those things that I always think is, I mean, most of us that are parents, we love our kids, right? I know you grandparents do. I'm not even going to ask that question. And we want what's best for them. And we try to help them along the way. Try and show them things, teach them things. And sometimes we have to discipline our children, right? Because that's part of it. We don't do that because we get joy out of heart in them. We do that because we're trying to help them become who we know they can be. And God is doing a similar work in you. He's trying to help you. And there may be times when you bristle up against that and you're kind of like, God, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. I don't want to talk to that person. I don't want to be a part of this situation or whatever it is that, that you and I throw up. And we think, well, God, I'm, I'm done. I'm tired of that. This is not right. It's too hard. Always remember, God loves you too much to leave you as you are. God doesn't just save us and say, oh, well, that's done. Got that one done. Don't care. Don't worry about it. We'll just let them go. As long as we got them, they're not going to hell. We're good. But instead, as, as we looked at earlier, he sanctifies us. He's changing us. He's molding us. He's transforming us to be more like Jesus. See, that's the end goal of the Christian. That's the standard. It's not Billy Graham or whomever you want to put up there. I don't know some paragon of sainthood you believe in, whoever you think it is, or maybe your grandmother, I don't know. The goal is Jesus. He's the standard. Now, honestly, we're never going to make it. <laughs> Can I say that? Is that fair? There is no way that I will be like Jesus, and neither were you, but that's the standard. But as I surrender and you and I surrender more and more to the will of God and the work of God in our life, we become more like Christ. And that's the goal, isn't it? It's not just about being a good Baptist or whatever other denomination you want to throw in there. Of course, here we got Baptists, we got Nazarenes, we probably got some Presbyterians, we may have some Pentecostals. I don't know, we got everything. That's, that's fine, that's good. It doesn't matter about that. What matters is that you become, you and I become more like Christ, right? He's the goal. And what an example we have by our Savior. And it's not just about striving and trying to, it's not about striving and trying to earn it, because salvation isn't something you earn, salvation is something we are given. But 
but it's about wanting to walk and live a life that exalts and honors the one who gave everything for me. It's out of love and obedience. It's out of love that I obey. I wanna wanna glorify him. I wanna exalt him. I want others to know about him because of what he's done for me and how he's changed me. Because he is everything and he is enough. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you Speak to us, and I pray, Father, you've used me in some way today as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to each of us, your people, Lord, and not so much about what I had to get through my list to say what I wanted to say, but more importantly, that the Holy Spirit guides this time to enable us to to walk through the text, to be where you want us to be, to focus on things that matter to you that you want your people to hear today. For you're doing a work in each and every one of our lives, God, and I pray that today would be the day that uh, if there is a day for someone that they've not come to know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be that day that they would give their life to you. If there's many of us, Father, that may be walking on the path and we know some areas where we need to, we need to surrender, we need to give up, we need to let you have full reign in our lives, that Lord, we'd be willing to do that as, today as well. Lord, I don't know what the needs are of every person in this room or the people even watching on our Live stream, I don't know, but you know all things. And I pray, Father, you meet each person where they are, minister to those needs that they have, and draw them to you, pointing all of us towards Christ-likeness. Because that's where you want us to be. Use this time for whatever purpose you have. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.